Well, that was a nice snapshot of the different voices around the world. Uh, the next generation, if you will, the Gen Zers, were very active on the issue we're tackling uh, today. I'm John Defterius, joining you from Dubai, and welcome to our session, Building Tomorrow's Energy Systems. As you know, it's part of the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Our timing for this roundtable discussion could not be better, uh, right in the midst of the United Nations uh, uh, UNGA and the package that's taking place in the General Assembly and the discussions around this topic, and also about five weeks ahead of COP26 in Glasgow. As I noted, I'm joining you from uh, Dubai today, and I yesterday in the last 24 hours uh, chaired three sessions uh, around uh, hydrocarbons with ministers from very large emerging markets. And I think the thing that came out of it for me, what stood out, is that we're living in a bipolar world. And I don't mean to be cute here, but you have the developed countries, uh, primarily in the West, the United States and Europe, laying out very clear strategies to net zero by 2050, uh, collaboration between the government and the capital markets, lots of investment flowing into this uh, sector of the world. And then the developing world, uh, the ministers I spoke to from uh, Bangladesh and Nigeria, Indonesia, very populated developing countries, saying for the next decade, they're kind of wedded to hydrocarbons uh, because they have these assets, they're lower cost, uh, oil and gas, gas as a transition fuel. They'd like to go uh, in a deeper way to renewable energy, but they're hamstrung by finance. So one of the topics here uh, in our session uh, today is, is this green fund really going to come to reality, be robust, and be long-term so these governments and companies around the world in the developing world can make plans? Uh, we're going to have a 40-minute session here. We welcome your comments. Uh, put them into the chat box, and I'd like to have your location and name, uh, if you'd like to, as well, uh, to pepper to our, our panel. Let me introduce them uh, now. First, the Deputy Secretary of Energy joining us from Washington is David Turk. Uh, John Moore is the Chief Executive Officer of Bloomberg uh, NEF. He joins us from, from the UK. Ignacio Galan is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Ibadrola. And Judith Hartman is Executive Vice President and CFO of the uh, French energy giant uh, Engie. Uh, a nice World Economic Forum. Welcome to uh, all of you. Before I get a chance to uh, begin our questioning, I wanted to bring up a, a slido, a side here of uh, a word cloud, and, and a key question that we'd like to have you weigh in, uh, put in your input to how you see COP26 uh, coming forward. How would you define uh, a great success from COP26 in Glasgow? What are your expectations uh, to come uh, in the next five weeks in this 12-day meeting that's taking place? Uh, we'll bring that slide up and then bring it up a little bit later to see those in the audience who have weighed in uh, as well. Uh, and, and in fact, I would like to start with the Deputy Secretary, uh, David Turk. Uh, David, you know, we saw some progress in the last 24 hours. And in fact, the last 48 hours, we had the UN Secretary General at the General Assembly say, uh, look, we need to move in a much more rapid way and consolidate the gains we've had so far and move further. We heard Boris Johnson, who is uh, the president of the COP26 as a country, the prime minister of the UK again. Uh, and also we've had uh, President Biden weigh in and then China suggesting he won't export any more coal plants. Uh, that's kind of late in the process. What kind of progress did we make? And very importantly, how do you consolidate it around COP26? Well, let, let me start, John, with a thank you for moderating and uh, thank you to our WEF colleagues for bringing us all together. And it's terrific to be on a panel with such leaders like uh, Ignacio, Judith, and John. And so I'm going to try to keep my comments short so that I can listen to them and learn from, from Ben as well. Um, I think it is true as we look at where we're at that we have made progress. We've made a lot of progress. And uh, not only in the last few days, but in the many months and uh, years before that. Uh, we at the Department of Energy and the U.S. government focus a lot on technology and technology costs. And it's quite remarkable uh, what we've been able to do. The U.S., countries around the world, private sector leaders around the world, really reducing those costs so that we can do things at scale. We can do solar PV at scale. We can do wind at scale. Um, but we need to keep reducing those costs further. So one of the key priorities for us is and I think this helps everybody's ambition. It helps political leaders' ambition in terms of NDC contributions. In the Paris Agreement, it helps companies uh, make ambitious uh, pledges going forward as well, is even on solar. We've seen solar PV costs be reduced dramatically 
uh, over recent years, but uh, we're going to keep pushing those costs down. So our goal is to reduce those costs another 60%. Uh, we're trying to reduce costs for hydrogen. Green hydrogen gets a lot of attention. We're trying to reduce those costs for green hydrogen to a dollar per kilogram uh, in this decade. Uh, electricity storage, especially long duration storage, such an important part of the equation as we get higher and higher intermittent renewables uh, penetration into our grids. We've got goals to reduce those costs 90% for that long duration storage over 10 hours. So as we focus on the political commitments, including the one that my president put on the table in terms of international finance, other commitments that are being made and will be made in the Paris Agreement, let's focus on where the progress is on the technology side, uh, which helps everybody, uh, frankly, and helps everybody be more uh, ambitious uh, as well. Okay, I want to talk to you about some of those technologies that are in place uh, today and kind of the moonshots of tomorrow. Uh, let's bring up uh, the Slido uh, and the word cloud here and see what the initial indications are from our audience. Again, we welcome the questions uh, coming in and we'll try to get to as many of them as uh, possible. I know we have a slight delay and, and we'll uh, pose a question at the same time here. Uh, John Moore, investments into hydrocarbons uh, tracking for the last five years, very close to about a trillion dollars. Uh, they, they dipped down prior to the pandemic in anticipation of this investment into renewables. Uh, but the renewable investment worldwide, if you factor in electric vehicles, about a half a trillion dollars. What needs to happen with that gap to get to net zero by 2050? Yeah, I, I mean, um, so th thank you very much for uh, having me on. Uh, it's really great to uh, share, share some thoughts. And um, so, so actually there's been, um, you know, a, a, an increase in investment over the last few years up to that half a trillion. Um, and again, depending on how you measure it, um, what you will see is that sort of on a private basis into fossil fuels, we think there's about 700 billion per annum going into that support. And on a private G20 uh, level, there's about another 700 billion. So you have a sort of $1.4 trillion going into fossil fuels. You have half a trillion flowing into renewables. So essentially what needs to happen over time is, is, is a transition towards, you know, from fossil fuels into renewables. And by our numbers, what we think is that um, to, to get near to Paris, the, the half a trillion needs to be between one and one and a half over the next decade, and then it needs to go up again, sort of two or three times to between two and four trillion dollars per annum. So it, it, it has to scale, but these are into technologies by then that would be proven. Um, so hopefully we see an acceleration um, from, but we really need to get moving this decade to see that uh, swing from fossil fuels into renewables and other clean technologies. Uh, Ignacio Galan, that sounds overly ambitious, what John's talking about here. And these are the facts of how to get to the targets that are set out, uh, not for the developed world, but uh, globally, right? Uh, is that feasible in your view and some of the markets that you're working in here that are uh, suffering from underinvestment and why the Green Fund that uh, President Biden committed to yesterday uh, is so important? So first, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. So I, I'm always optimistic. I think today are more than 180 countries signed the Paris Agreement. So the civil society is present to, to make changes. And I'm confident that the uh, progress, some progress is going to be made already in Glasgow in the COP26. So uh, uh, I think I'm in the sector since uh, 20 years. And I think the situation is very different today than what it was uh, at that time. Many government regulators, competitors, were not convinced about the need of uh, fight against uh, climate change. Uh, today, that is not the situation. So uh, I think we in Agrojola, we've been already moving ahead uh, since then. I think we have invested uh, heavily, so 140 billion in renewables, electricity, networks, storage, all those things we documented today. And we, trans we transform the company in things with uh, uh, everybody agrees now. But uh, I think my first point is, uh, as John Kerry says, is we need to accelerate. I think the sense of urgency, uh, most of uh, the things have to be done during the decade. Uh, if we are not already uh, 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 move rapidly, we will not reach our goals. We have to need to invest uh, massively in renewables, smart grid, and storage. And I think, as David was commenting, we have the technology, we have the skill, we have the financial resources, but we need 
things which are not dependent, is depending on the administration, faster permitting processes. It, takes, it still continues fine four, five, six years to obtain a permit for making anything. But either for renewable, either for networks, I think it's, uh, it's uh, almost impossible in most countries. Clear and stable framework. I think I, 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 this is not that one for many reasons. I would comment later on. Tax policies, applying the principle who politics pay. So we cannot change the rules anytime because of the temporary situation. We cannot jump from subsidizing renewables to penalizing them, yet we call it temporary situation uh, of the global community prices. We have to be very consistent with investment that mature over 40, 50, 60 years. So I think uh, 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 there are already rules. I think it's, uh, in the European Union, it's already a clear path of, uh, about carbon neutrality with the Green Deal and Fit for 55 law. But I think now, because of this temporary situation, some countries is penalizing already uh, this clean energy. So I, I think there are a situation which is absolutely crazy. We are moving that today, uh, they are uh, already paying gas uh, fire power plants, 20 euros per megawatt hour, coal 60 euros per megawatt hour, uh, and wind, hydro, nuclear, between 80 and 100 euros per megawatt hour. That is not already considered, just because of the temporary situation. And that is, that is my concern. That put the European model at risk. The Commission cannot stay apart. It needs to take action to make uh, the, the, the fifth for 55 will be a reality. ETS is not a new model. It's a model that was already developed 50 years ago. Everybody knew that the power carbon price is going to increase. Now they are discovering that the prices, because it's increasing, it is affecting to the price of, the, of energy. But everybody knew then that is already what they had decided mm. for them. So I have to say the opposite about the United States. The United States, we are already, you know, we have very important presence in this country, like 25 states, 40 billion invested. So, and I think the United States has already the same regime based in tax incentive for 50 years, no change, independent to the change of the federal authorities. And that is, the result is they are more renewable here than elsewhere. And they're already extending this model as well now for networks. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think, but as well, here they have the same problem about permitting, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, for me, uh, the concern is if we would like to convince and other countries to follow the, our path, American and European path. So we have to be very consistent, stable, and transmit the sense of urgency. We cannot change the rules in the middle of the way because of the temporary situation of the gas price. That, that is a disaster. We cannot convince countries you mentioned before, but because that, what, what is about you? You change the things because you have a temporary situation. I think uh, for completing my, my point is consistency, stability, Sense of urgency and no change of rules because of temporary situation we can affect to the temporary prices of electricity. Yes, and I know you're making reference to the gas price hikes we're seeing here uh, in the, the European Union, in particular the UK. It's been uh, topping headlines this week. Uh, as a result of this, Judith, it seems to me we're in that space in between, right, in the transition. There was some underinvestment. Uh, we drew down um, inventories of gas uh, because of the longer winter last year. We have that price squeeze, uh, but there's been underinvestment in hydrocarbons and not enough renewable energy to fill the gap yet. Is that how you see it? And this is the reality of the transition. It will be painful at different times and consumers will pay higher prices. No, I think, uh, John, it's great to see you, first of all, and, and great to see the, the rest of the panelists. Uh, what, what you just uh, talked about, I think, is a great proof that uh, energy is two things. You need to be, you have to have some long-term thinking, uh, and uh, you need to have a, a balance. Uh, you know, uh, often when people talk about the energy transition, they talk about just wind and solar, that's obviously incredibly important. You know, NG, we're investing billions a year and are very confident that this is a huge opportunity for all of us. But, but really what you're seeing here is the system at the end has to work and it's not going to be by one technology. You're going to have to have a, uh, a balance here. Gas will be there for some time to stay, to deal with the intermittency of, uh, of the renewables. And then, uh, of course, over time, it's going to be incredibly important to work on the greening of gas. You know, today, much of it is uh, still uh, fossil, but you know, France, as, a, as an example, has a target of a 10% biomethane uh, target in, uh, 
in 2030, which in uh, energy terms is very quickly. And we believe that by 2050, all gas is going to be a renewable gas. And I think, you know, once you put it all together and, and uh, like it was mentioned earlier by John, there's so many technologies now available and we should not bet our house or our planet on just one a solution because we will need a mix of things. The good news is there's trillions of uh, dollars literally flowing into uh, into uh, ESG funds. And so there's a lot of uh, money available for investment. So if we uh, create the right circumstances, the regulatory is of course uh, incredibly important. Like Inasir just brought it up. And quite frankly, I am personally very confident that we can make this happen. But sense of urgency is what we need. Now, I think by 2030, we need to have all the target of uh, reducing by half our CO2 emissions. And, and certainly, uh, certainly that's our commitment at ENGIE. Okay, we did promise uh, the uh, response from the word cloud, and we can t check into it a little bit later as well. Let's bring that up now to see what our audience is thinking. And we're getting some questions from uh, the audience as well. Uh, so what are the key expectations, your key expectations from COP26 to enable the global transition to net zero? Commitment to coal phase out, and this was a discussion that was good that China uh, gave that uh, sort of commitment, turning commitments into reality to Ignacio's point here, we've got to be bolder. Uh, energy transition pathway, acting earlier than 2050. We see a number of companies saying we'll be net zero uh, by 2035. Some countries are trying to do uh, the same thing. Speed, scale, net zero, business leadership, which is uh, obviously from NG and from Iberdola is there at this stage. So very interesting, the feedback that we're getting and finance for technology. And I'd like to pick up on that topic uh, now, if we can. Uh, David, I, I know President Biden said, we've got this fund, here's our commitment to it. The criticism of the developed world is that we have democracies and there are four, five, six year cycles on the election cycles. And then you know what's going to happen with the next leader. We saw what we had with President Trump, who's not even part of the Paris Climate Agreement. To Ignacio's point, how do we give clarity, line of sight, continuity to the developing world in your view, David? Well, thank, thanks, John. And um, really interesting word cloud that you just put up. And the ones that really stuck out to me is, is absolutely key are turning commitments to reality mm. and then the speed uh, and scale. Uh, we've got to move with a speed and scale here that's unprecedented. And while we have made significant progress, as Ignacio and other panelists have said, and many others have spoken very eloquently about this, we've got to just move with that speed and pace, that speed and pace and scale uh, like we've never done before. Finance is absolutely key, John. Uh, incredibly, as a U.S. citizen, incredibly gratifying to see the U.S. step up, the leadership by President Biden. And it's not just the speech that he... Uh, made yesterday at the General Assembly, uh, it's been the leadership that he's brought to the table from day one, uh, joining the Paris, rejoining the Paris Agreement, uh, the climate summit that I think was incredibly helpful this spring to really keep that momentum, to put people on notice that everyone's paying attention to what commitments they put on the table uh, during that uh, point in time. I've had a chance to uh, travel a few times with Secretary Kerry and all his phenomenal leadership around the world really trying to make sure that this is a shared enterprise, all of us working together on those levels of commitment. Finance is key, of course, John. I think it's useful to think of finance a couple different ways. One is, and I go back to an earlier point, the more we can use our R&D levers, our other levers domestically and in collaboration with others to reduce those technology costs, that's a, good, that's a public good for everybody. If we're able to make progress in the US or Europe or India or elsewhere and reduce those costs for solar PV, that's gonna allow more financing, more solar PV out into the market. So we need to focus on that technology cost part of it as we focus on the finance piece. And then the other point to make I think here is incredibly important for governments to step up. That's what President Biden was doing yesterday in terms of the commitments and the messages that he was sending our European colleagues, of course, and others stepping up on that front in terms of the public finance piece. Uh, but we've got to work hand in hand with uh, investors, with the private sector, with companies. We need investment at such a scale, by some estimates, 23 trillion that we need for this clean energy transition. And that's probably a low estimate of what we actually need here. We need to have that finance from the private sector, from the investors, work with other governments on the enabling environments and other kinds of mechanisms 
to really get that flowing. We're starting to see that, but as has been clear already in this panel, we just need that pace and scale uh, even further, including and especially on the finance front. Well, the, the numbers are extraordinary, and I've seen even higher ones from uh, Arena, for example, here in the UAE, right up to thirty-one trillion dollars by uh, twenty fifty. Let's take some questions from our audience, and I'll I'll let everybody weigh in, and I'll call on you so you don't have to kind of shout through the box. What's the one policy intervention that could, in your opinion, really make a difference in speeding up the process? of decarbonization? And I know this is not an easy question because you have European policy or national policy. For example, uh, Mr. Galan in, in Spain, uh, Judith, where you sit in, in Paris normally. But what is the one policy intervention that could, in your opinion, really make a difference in speeding up the process of decarbonization? Judith, you want to start? Sure. I think the, the one thing that could make a huge difference is really the is to speed up coal exit. So we have uh, in Europe, as you know, uh, certain countries have given a 2030 target. Germany has given a 2038 target. Uh, there are certain countries who have not, not given any uh, dates at all. It is uh, quite outstanding that we're still having this debate, to be honest, because uh, uh, coal is, of course, the most, uh, most polluting way of uh, generating electricity. And given that we have so many options now on renewables, uh, on uh, on green gas, like I said earlier, it is, uh, this would be the one thing that could make a huge difference very, very quickly. And so I think we should all commit to that uh, and, and get our respective governments to go faster on this topic. Okay, good. Again, that was a good sign from China, but uh, they've been exporting plants uh, pretty aggressively, uh, especially into uh, Africa. Mr. Galan, do you, what, what did you say is the number one policy decision? You said you picked out a few in your opening remarks about uh, tax policy, providing some incentives here. Uh, David alluded to that and the new technology to foster to get it back into the market faster. The one policy recommendation was a question from our audience. So I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, Europe in the fifth of 55 is already contemplating uh, several things, and, and I come again to the point of a sense of urgency. I think they are already just yes, planning to uniformize the European taxation of energy. It's, it's an S. Every country does whatever they like. So I think it's impossible to make anything because it depends on the, every country. Every country can do whatever. The second one, they are planning as well to modify to make a directive for a permitting. So, but I think they're planning to make that for 2024. I said another day to Ursula von Leyen, to the president, I think 2024 is too late. When all this will be already completed, is uh, we are over, it will be of, over the 2030. And another one is very important, is to keep the market rules, no intervention. I think I think there's something with David was saying, uh, two words, which I think is very important for me, in scale. And I would like to put the example what the United States has already made with these two things. I think, you know, we have the pioneers in this country in offshore. I think we've been during the previous administration for months and months and years and years, postponing delay the permits for making already the first offshore wind farm in this country. So the new administration came within two months, was done what has not been done in the last four years. The second one, they have already made something which is very important, scale. So they are already making options at the same time, a huge option, in such a way that they can attract the investor, not only investor, but as well industry. We can already provide wealth in the country because they, uh, they, they are already enough critical mass for that. And the third one is finance. I think it's uh, uh, as well, finance means to reduce capex. You, you need already a certain level of scale. But I think, I think something which is already committed, commented, not very much. You, everybody talk about the reduction of price of PB, which I think absolutely agree. But it's more important to have already cheap and easy access to transmission. Mm. So in most countries, the bottleneck is not because of the cost of the PV or the cost of the wind, which is a problem we have to continue reducing. It's the difficulties to have already transmission and the cost that this transmission represents and the time we take. I think we've been for the last seven years to make an interconnection between Canada and Massachusetts. So it's plenty of uh, litigations, continuous litigation, and it makes it impossible to bring the clean electricity from one part to another one. But the same thing to export electricity from New Mexico. I was yesterday there from New Mexico to California where they spread in it. It's long and long time. I think it scale the finance. The finance is not only the cost of the renewable, it's the cost of all the things which are around mostly transmission and distribution that we would like to achieve. Okay, Mr. Galan. I mean, yeah. market rules. 
Okay, perfect. We have to just watch the length of our answers uh, at this stage going forward because we have so many uh, questions coming in from the audience at the same time. Uh, this raises a question I wanted to pepper our panel with. John Moore, uh, one of the questions that came up is, uh, what role do you expect nuclear power to uh, play in, in the future? The Minister of Energy from Bangladesh said that they're, they're working on a plant right now and they want to tap into that cleaner energy. Uh, upfront costs are high. Uh, the output is pretty low, but you have to stretch it out to, to pay it back over like four decades. Do you, you follow the money, uh, John? What do you see here in terms of uh, investment into the nuclear sector? And why is it not mentioned more when it comes to the transition? Sure. A, a really great question. And um, so actually we looked at, in our, um, in our last forecast, we looked at three different um, solutions, one of which was based around nuclear and actually using nuclear to create green hydrogen as one of the solutions for, for uh, yeah, 2040s and 2050s. And um, so, you know, it, it will depend really on the geography. It will depend on the country, the country view. Um, Nuclear ha probably has a role. As we've said, there needs to be so much rollout that if you go down a pure path of, say, uh, you know, renewables and green hydrogen, the scale of build out is absolutely enormous for all of those technologies. Um, if you look at sort of gas and CCS, again, the, the investment in CCS is enormous. So any pure um, approach is going to be difficult. Um, so it'll really depend country by country where um, nuclear is acceptable and where nuclear can be a sort of piece of the solution, let's say. Um, and I think that will be one of the, the, the areas where countries sort of will decide their own roadmaps depending on where they start today. It's not obvious that a lot will, will become new nuclear powers, but there's already a, you know, a lot of nuclear around right now. And um, you know, certainly that can be rolled forward and have a, a positive impact. So I think there'll be certain nuclear countries, let's say, um, that are using nuclear um, to generate you know, green hydrogen and those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, the other question I wanted to present to you is because we're looking for solutions here, uh, and I'd love to have our panel. David Turk, you, you can talk about it because of the role of, of the U.S. as shareholders in the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Investment Infrastructure uh, Fund, AIIB, of course, uh, African Development Bank. Shouldn't we have a more aggressive mandate for these development banks uh, to really make it fly and say that this should be our number one concentration over the next 10 to 20 years. It seems like we're kind of crawling to the process, uh, David. Is that a fair criticism? So there's no doubt, John, we need to do a whole lot more in a whole lot of areas. Uh, and to the earlier question on what single policy or uh, this technology or that technology or this finance mechanism or that finance mechanism, the short answer is we need a whole lot more of a whole lot more uh, policy, technology, and on the finance side. So I think your point's an excellent one. We need to be thinking about the World Bank. We need to be thinking about the regional development banks. We need to be leveraging them as much as we possibly can. We've had a lot of discussion uh, in the U.S. government, not only with our Treasury colleagues who coordinate our relationship with those, uh, those banks, those regional banks and the World Bank, but I've had uh, personal discussions with the head of USAID, our bilateral development agency, Samantha Power, who is very passionate on these issues, and I'm convinced there's a lot more we can be doing from the USAID side of things and other countries bilaterally in terms of uh, helping other countries move on the mitigation side and help on the adaptation side. We've got the DFC, which does a lot of international deals. We can leverage that further to get even more benefit. But uh, we have to uh, take a step back, appreciate how much we have to do to fundamentally transform our energy economies in a very, very short amount of time to be consistent with the IPCC the experts, our scientific consensus, and what we're seeing around us with wildfires, droughts, and other kinds of mm. things. So we just need a whole lot more of a whole lot of instruments, policy instruments, finance instruments, and technology levers uh, as well. Okay, I don't want to be the doomsayer, but as I was saying, I was sitting on a panel with uh, uh, ministers of energy from Nigeria, Bangladesh, Indonesia, very populated developing countries. Uh, Indonesia's coal demand, because they have there's so much growth right now post-pandemic, uh, shot up uh, and they're still uh, searching for gas. They've got major IOCs or international energy companies in Indonesia exploring for gas right now. What do we do about the very populated countries of the world, India in particular, which needs the financing, Indonesia, Nigeria, Bangladesh, which are kind of wedded 
to either coal or other hydrocarbons right now. Judith, you work in these in these countries as NG. Uh, what's the best solution here? I mean, you bring up a good point, John. Uh, it, uh, there isn't one solution uh, that fits all, and certain of these countries still depend on coal. But, uh, you know, again, like I said earlier, collectively we need to move towards uh, more renewables and, and complement it with gas. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, at, at NG decided to exit coal. We have reduced our CO2 by 50% already in the last five years. We're going to have to do another 50% uh, in, in the next, uh, until 2030. And I think if we all collectively put our minds to it, then we can make it happen. So, you know, to be concrete in these countries, renewables is, is equally important. Uh, uh, some of these countries have a lot of sun, so to create um, a green hydrogen, because often you will need gas, including on transportation transportation often uh, and, uh, and electricity production. Those are some of the uh, options that we need to look at. You know, uh, Dave mentioned it earlier, we need to get the cost curves down on some of these technologies still. And certainly what we can do also in the developed countries is really to work on those cost curves so we can then deploy it in, in the countries that need it the most and that have the highest energy needs, uh, the growing energy needs, of course, because of their population growth. So um, uh, local renewables, local uh, green hydrogen, uh, the, the transportation that comes with it, all of that technologically is possible. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we're going to have to tap into some of the financial instruments that you've seen because as private that you've mentioned, because as private companies, we need to have, uh, you know, uh, a, a certain uh, security around our investments and, of course, the returns that come with it. And, and that, quite frankly, in some of the more complex uh, countries, we will need uh, some support from, uh, from the financial institutions. Okay, I want to ask the team uh, from the World Economic Forum to bring back up that word cloud and see if it's uh, altered through our conversations here. Uh, uh, Ignacio, I'd love to get your thoughts coming out of COP26 what do you want to hear to address these major emerging markets? We shouldn't be debating about a green energy fund and, and lacking commitments. Uh, number one, uh, U.S. and China, can this energy and the energy transition and climate change be the unifying policy between the U.S. and China? Uh, Ignacio, give us, give us that in about a minute because we're a little bit tight on time. You're muted there, uh, Ignacio. Thank you. I will say something about the previous question. I think the first thing to convince, we have to convince the emerging countries that today CapEx uh, in solar or CapEx in wind is cheaper than CapEx in a coal or CapEx uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a combined cycle of gas. So I, I think they, they need less capital for generating. The second one, I think they can already make themselves self-sufficient. They will not depend on the import of other countries. So I, I think these two things are important. The third one is related financing. I think it's a big change, a big improvement in the financing. The green bonds are there. So I think today, uh, uh, many uh, companies, we, are, uh, we have access to green bonds. I think Iberdrola, we are one of the leaders in issuing green bonds, more than $40 billion already have for issuing green bonds. But what is the problem of uh, achieving the green bonds? I come again, stability, predictability, clear rule, rule of law. And that is what we have to request to the countries to have access to that one, because the money is available, but I think those ones which are putting money for 40, 50, 60 years, they are asking for stability, predictability, clear rule, not changing the rules at the middle of the, of the match, et cetera. So what we are expecting on the on COP26, well, the first one, we are the main sponsor of COP. So I think we are already, our headquarters in, the, in Britain and in Glasgow, all of you are invited to come there. It's a beautiful office, and that I'm sure that we will, a part of the conclusion, we can already enjoy a wonderful time there with uh, the Glasgow people. is very, very nice, and I think we can already make it. I, I think what I expect, I'm always optimistic. I was starting saying, what are, I've been already attending the COPs in Copenhagen, so I see how the world has evolved in this period, how the people is already understanding, because of the civil society pressure, that they have to be done. So in Ashworth in Glasgow, uh, uh, is going to be as well as well another SD4 on this one. I think the main problem will be who is going to finance the, uh, the uh, renewable expansion in the, in the emerging countries. But I think everybody is like a pandemic. I think it's something which affects everybody. If all of us, we are not doing all the necessary 
So the, 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 therefore, we are making one part of the plan and can, it is affecting to the another part of the plan. So mm. it's a common effort to try to solve the situation. And I'm sure that, that that is the point. That's why I come to my point. It's very important that those countries, what we have already made the leadership, European Union, in this moment, United States, will be very consistent in our policy. We cannot change the rules just because of temporary situation. We can already affect the market. If we are intervening in the energy market, if we are changing the taxation rules, if we are already just uh, not providing the stability, who is going to trust in our model is the corporate one. So for me, that is the main thing. We have to provide already a, a real, a real a good path for those which are, have to follow our, 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 our line. If not, I will start to no more believe in us. So I think that, that for me is very important. I'm optimistic because the social, the, the, the young people especially, that is the, the main uh, thing that they are arguing when you talk with them, that climate change is at the top of their priorities. And we, the, the, those we have the responsibility in running the companies or running the countries, we have to provide already a solution for them. And I'm sure that is going to happen. And Glasgow is a good place for already just trying to achieve this. All you are invited to. Uh, Ignacio, I, I like your optimism because the, the world needs a rally at this period. I have a question for both John Moore and Judith, the same question, then I'm going to uh, conclude with David Turk. Um, for John and Judith, uh, the impact of environmental social governance, uh, we saw a lot of different pro proclamations from major fund managers saying that you cannot be invested or have that exposure to hydrocarbons uh, and uh, take money from us, basically, is the bottom line. So should we follow the money on Wall Street, the city of London and Frankfurt, the major capitals like Paris? And if you track it, John, is it having an influence on where the money's flowing? And does that model need to be applied to the developing world at the same time? Judith, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the impact ESG's had on the makeup of NG as well. Let's start with John. Um, th thank you. So, I mean, there's certainly been a, a huge, massive uptick in ESG. Um, so we're already had more inflows this year um, year to date than we had in the whole of, of last year. Um, and things like sustainable debt, we've already had as much in half one of this year than we had in the whole of the prior year. And the three years before that, it had already trebled. So the good news is there really is money flowing in. Um, there's a lot of commitments being made. Um, so now 70% of emissions are covered by some form of government commitment. So that's so that's another good good thing. So people are setting targets. Um, I think the gap we have to close is is really the implementation gap. How to deploy those funds? Where to deploy those funds? And that's where I think it needs to be looked at on a country by country basis because every country will have a different path, and every country will need to sort of invite investors in um, using the right policies, using the, having the right goals, um, adopting the right standards. So there's, uh, there's something called TCFD, which is a standard for um, climate reporting um, that investors will look at. Mm -hmm. So again, adoption of those standards is a way of attracting um, foreign investors. So the money is there, but you have to attract it in um, with great targets and good standards um, uh, to, to really get that deployed in the right way. Okay, very good. Judith, for you, because we're a little bit tight on time here, one minute, then I'll ask for the same from David Turk, please. No, so uh, the ESG is, uh, there's a, there's literally trillions. Every time we talk, there's a trillion more, basically, quite frankly, flowing into this. Uh, I think that the way I distinguish is, is equity, funding, debt, uh, and then on the project level. And I think we are not fully there yet. On the green bonds, I agree with Ignacio, since his company and mine are the global leaders on green bonds with close to 14 billion each that we've been able to issue. I think that's, you know, for me, the most obvious because you can really tag it to uh, specific projects. When you look at the rest, though, there is uh, many initiatives uh, that are all very good initiatives, but there's no common language yet. And so what, I, what we're seeing is that there is a lot of money going into renewable pure players on their, on their stocks, and you have very high multiples that come with it. But surely that cannot be the solution, right? It's not going to be like three companies on their own that are going to make this planet work when it comes to uh, uh, energy. And so collectively, we need to commit to transparency. Find, I think we have like two, three years here, really important to find a common language that investors can really distinguish and follow the ones that mean it. You know, uh, have a zero carbon date, yes, but have intermittent, uh, you know, uh, dates also of where you're committed.
CO2 reduction and so on. And, and really think as companies, we need to commit to that. And as investors, uh, we need to get, get more sophisticated to, uh, to be able to read, just like we read somebody's a company's balance sheet, we need to get more sophisticated on reading ESG to really place that money. Because I do believe, I'm quite optimistic actually, that money will be available. But right now it's, uh, it's too concentrated in very few places when of course it's a global need and we all need to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, to invest and to uh, use these funds to move the energy uh, planet forward. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very precise on what you're saying. Let's bring up the word cloud one more time, and then I'm going to present the question uh, to, to Deputy Secretary uh, Turk. Uh, the question to our audience was, what are your key expectations from COP26 to enable the global transition uh, to net zero? And you can see uh, the expansion of some of these key uh, phrases here, commitment to coal phase out, uh, and that's not taking place in many parts of the world, as I was noting there. Turning commitments to reality, energy transition pathway, that has to be clear uh, to Judith Hartman's point here. Acting earlier than 2050, and, and I know there's a lot of pressure from the next generation saying, geez, the baby boomers, you guys have been asleep at the wheel. Why didn't you wake up to the challenge earlier? Uh, to Ignacio's point, it has to get done at COP26. And what is a real uh, energy transition? Uh, David Turek, uh, we've been talking about the developing world. I'm just very concerned that they're moving at a slower pace and they need some support. Uh, for you at COP26, what's the success that we walk away and say, you know what, we are tackling those who need the financing most, most and we have these mechanisms in place. Uh, what's realistic from Glasgow? I think that the, the key thing, John, I took from the word cloud, and I think what we need to keep our eye on the ball is, is the real world. What's happening in the real world? Uh, the word cloud had action, it had early action. Uh, I think that's what we really need to be focused on is what is actually happening in the real world, not just in the US and in Europe, uh, but just as you said, John, uh, in India, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. I was just in India a few weeks ago to talk with our Indian colleagues, uh, five or six different ministries there. What could we do uh, sharing expertise? What could we do collaborating? to try to help us all move forward as quickly as we can. In the real world, I think we've got a two to three window, uh, year window of time here where we either step up and are serious about implementing these technologies with the policy levers, with the finance levers at scale that puts us on, again, as the word cloud said, that trajectory, that pathway uh, to net zero going forward. And if we don't do that in this next couple year period of time, as we come out of the COVID crisis, as our president has said, we can't just build back, we need to build back better. And I think this next couple year window of time coming out of Glasgow with the commitments uh, on ambition, incredibly important, but we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, no doubt all of us need to roll up our sleeves on this panel and many others out there uh, and get to work on those impacts in the real world. Okay, so all the members on this panel, which I'm sure will be in Glasgow, don't let them walk away and I'll be there as well. Don't let them walk away without a deal is what we need to do. We need a commitment across the board. Uh, what a fantastic group. I appreciate the audience participation on the word cloud, and we couldn't get to all the questions, but they were all very robust. Obviously, people that track this very carefully. Uh, Judith Hartman of uh, NG, good to see you again. Ignacio Galan, it's always great to have your expertise. Uh, John Moore putting the, the money flows from Bloomberg NEFs uh, into, uh, into the context that we needed here between hydrocarbons and renewables. And David Turk, couldn't ask for a better uh, government voice in terms of breaking down the realities of today. Thanks for joining us.